Welcome to the Rex Andrews Show. Glad to have you with us today. If you are new to the program, welcome. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And of course, I am a well-dressed beggar because I've got a collar on today and we're not bashful to beg. So please give us those stars in the, uh, in the app stores. We appreciate that. It helps us. If you are an existing uh, listener, we want to uh, thank you. And uh, I've got a new thing we're doing now is we're recognizing people, uh, different corners of the world. And so with over 460 cities that are represented, welcome to the folks in La Vista, Nebraska. If you've never been to La Vista, you need to go. I've been there. So fantastic. Glad to have you. If you don't like the uh, podcast platform you're on, that's okay. There's 23 different ones that carry us around the globe. We have listeners in 32 countries on six continents. And if I could figure out how to market to penguins, but probably more important, help them charge their cell phones, we would probably have some listeners in Antarctica. All right. Again, one of the most important things, because you know you can find us everywhere on all the major social media platforms, but stop by the show website. And the reason why I tell you to do that is um, we have information and biographies of our guests. So our current guests today, previous guests, and well, the upcoming list, which is pretty deep. Um, the reason I tell you to do that is because we're going to talk about our guests um, every time we do a show, but we don't get time to do it all. So you can go there, get some bio information, links to their businesses, their social media. So I always rem remember to tell people, stop by the rexandrewshow.com. All right. So I'm um, excited about today's uh, episode. Uh, this is a very interesting person. I've got our first recording happening from Germany today. So we do interview people around the globe, but this is the first one from Germany. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, she's a wife and mom, which are probably the most important designations for her. Uh, she's an expatriate. She's uh, actually living in Europe. And I think she has a little bit of wanderlust in her uh, DNA. She's an Airbnb uh, super host. Uh, she is an entrepreneur. She's a writer, a content creator. And then this is the one that caught my eye and I think it's very interesting and we're gonna poke her about this one. She's a professional leaper, okay? And after talking to her off air, I can relate to that. So uh, I'd like to welcome to the show today, Aaron Thomas. Aaron, how are you? Hey, hey, I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. It's early and wet here in Boulder today, so uh, a little bit crazy. Well, it's late late and wet here in Stuttgart, <laughs> Germany, so I can relate. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, you know, Aaron, as you've listened to the show, um, the show is all about people's stories and how people got to where they are today. You know, success does not fall out of the sky, and uh, so we like to learn about people's backgrounds and you know, the big thing that I help uh, people do is to understand the stories behind where people were. I mean, especially young people, you know, they think, oh, I'm going to do this and this and or they're afraid or those types of things. So what I'd like to do, and this is a little bit of a long list, but I'll, I'll take you to these. So don't remember, you don't have to remember them all right away. We'd like to know where you were born. Okay. Where you grew up. And that is often different from when we're born. I have a ghost, I mean, a guest that is, uh, uh, her name is um, Ellie Soja, and Ellie lived in 63 different places before the age of 15. And so being born and, and raised is different things. We'd like to know about your um, youth growing up. What did you spend time on? Um, interest, whether it was, you know, uh, sports, drama, theater, computers, shoplifting, don't laugh at that. We had a guest that was uh, a car thief by age 15. Um, we'd like to know about your parents, okay? Parental influence is huge because it can be sometimes a supportive thing, like my mom and dad helped me get places, or it could be a motivator that says, I don't wanna be anything like that, okay? Uh, a little bit about your education, and then we'll kind of hop around and see how are you the professional leaper? So Aaron, if you could uh, take us back, where were you born? So I was born in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, okay. That that ended up staying home. I was kind of the opposite of your previous guest, Ellie. Um, I stayed in one place pretty much. Uh, we traveled um, as a family for vacations and things like that. But 
Um, born and raised in Charleston. Um, I'm an only child. Okay. So it was just, you know, the three of us and I had an awesome childhood. I'm definitely in the camp where my parents were my biggest cheerleaders, um, mentors, learned so much from them. Um, so I'm very fortunate in that, in that regard. Fantastic. So what did you spend your time doing in your spare time growing up? I was a gymnast. So oh, I'm wow. five foot one. That's on the best day. Um, you know, uh, 95 pounds, maybe <laughs> spot. Gymnastics was, was life. Um, and I did that up until about high school, at which point I kind of switched gears and got into soccer, got into uh, some public speaking, took my first Dale Carnegie course and kind of found a love for stories and speaking okay. and, and doing all the things. So that's. Okay. So what age did you take the Carnegie uh, course? The first one I took, I want to say I was maybe in 10th grade. Oh, wow. Um, they came and did a, a setup at our school that was kind of like an eight week thing after school for an hour. And it, it was a wonderful first experience watching these people, you know, each week we'd have different speakers come and, and they were so captivating. And we had a group ranging from, I don't know, 15 to 18 and, and they kept all of us engaged and, and had great stories to tell and great motivation. And, and it was a wonderful experience. Fantastic. I think uh, you've, I've been finally been beat. I took a Dale Carnegie at 19 and also did a Briggs Myers. And so, um, yeah, it's, that's cool. I think that's awesome. All right. So um, you got to, you became a soccer player. Uh, did you leave gymnastics? I just, this is an odd question, but you know, a lot of times when we focus on sports as kids so much after six or seven years, you can be burnt out. Okay. Were you burnt out or would just, just soccer look fun or, you know, I think, I think it was probably a combination. You know, I had been in it. Um, I started in first grade. I uh -huh. had stayed the whole way up and I had become very competitive. Uh, it was a, it was a wonderful thing, but what I found is as I got older, you know, it kept me uh, away from school friends. It kept me away from, you know, when school, the bell would ring, I would head to the gym Right. Where my friends were heading, you know, to practice there at, at school and they could see each other. Weekends were spent traveling for competitions where. So I think it was kind of like, you know, approaching teenagehood yeah. played a big role. Um, and I wouldn't say that I became necessarily a soccer player. I just liked it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I did it as a as something to enjoy. I also played back role in volleyball, which at yeah. five foot, nothing that says, <laughs> you know, that says something, but, um, it was good. You know, Charleston is a coastal town. So the beach and the lake, we were a boating family. That was kind of a way of life. I grew up water skiing a lot too. So I would say just kind of activity and being in constant motion was a, a common thread. Well, that's great. I think that's uh, very ad admirable. You know, in today's sports, it's really easy for these organizations to get kids totally wrapped up into sports and it consumes their life. Agree. Oh, it's just crazy. And the days of parent coaches are gone and everything is just, you know, over the top competitive and they, they try to sell you that you're going to do something with it. And, you know, I, all my kids played sports. My foot, my sons were standout football players and, and, I just got to a point, you know, I had a friend of mine who actually played in the NFL, okay? And he would say to people, um, never specialize until you're getting paid to specialize. And, Very good statement there. Yeah, and so that's great that you swapped around because I, I just think it's crazy. You know, you get these kids that are seven, eight, nine years old and they're telling, telling them to specialize. I think that's nuts. Well, and you know, I have a daughter that's my daughter's nine and uh -huh. we've tried our hand at, at a few sports. I mean, it, that's what you do as children. And what we find is some of these kids have been doing this for four and five years now. And, yeah. and the parents are already committed to, you know, travel every week. I mean, they're, they're scholarship focused and they're yeah. the end game focused. And to me, and, and, and I'm really big on telling my daughter, you know, this is when you're trying on to see what fits. This yeah. is, it's okay. Now I'm, I'm not one on, I mean, if we try it on, we're committed to the season, 
yeah. because I think it's important we don't quit because I just don't feel like running. But right, right. You know, the I I agree with you completely that it has changed significantly. Yeah. When I was a kid growing up, I mean, I'm 55. We moved from one sport to the next. As soon as football season were over, you picked up either wrestling or basketball. Yeah. And when that was over, you did baseball or track. And you you were busy year round and you weren't, you know, focused on scholarship. I had a, I had a professional, and I didn't mean to go into this, but we'll, we'll finish it up here. I had a good friend who um, his son played hockey. His son was a pretty good hockey player. And Barry was spending about eleven, twelve thousand $12,000 a year for his kid to play hockey. And I asked him one day, well, what's your end game here? What's your objective? And he says, oh, I just want to help him get a college scholarship. And I said, Barry, if you've been paying that much money, uh, you know, from seven, <laughs> six or seven years on, you could pay for his school anywhere, anywhere. Exactly. So, yes. Yeah, you know, it's really sad. And it's really, it's really bad that the, the, these coaches and associations are selling this go do something with it thing. It's just silly. It's just well, silly. and the pressure, the pressure that it kind of puts on yeah. to kids, because if you look percentage wise at the number of kids who become even collegiate athletes, but especially professional athletes, I mean, it's very, very small. Oh, it's so extremely. to put this pressure, and I'm sure like your friend's son, you know, he's aware that his dad has spent a lot of money. What if he wants to try basketball? Yeah. Or what if he doesn't want to play it on a collegiate level? Or what if then you're kind of in this, you know, I'm kind of committed now because yeah. my dad has spent and devoted his whole life to this. Yeah. Well, and, and you see a burnout. It happens all the time. Yes. You know, kids will get to be high school age and then all of a sudden just they drop mom and dad's dream. And yeah. you, we would see it a whole bunch when kids get to high school and, and my, when my boys playing football and the kids wouldn't play because they were washed. They were tired. You know, they, they wanted to do something else. So. All right. Well, we'll get off of that tangent, but I'm glad we were <laughs> agreeing on that. So um, when you got finished with high school, what was your next top? My next hop, I went to College of Charleston. Okay. Um, I stayed, so I moved downtown into the heart of the city. I loved living in the heart of a city. So I would say that was kind of my first, even though it was less than an hour from my home, um, it was kind of the first venture into city life. Okay. Um, I loved everything about it, all the people, all the options, the life, the, the feel. Um, yeah. You know, and I started college thinking I was going to go to med school. So I was going to be pre-med. And uh, really quickly, what I learned is that I was looking most forward to the creative writing courses, the electives in speaking, the all these things. And I was dreading the bio and the chem. And, um, <laughs> the big, so heavy it, books, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so by about my second year, sometime, I think, in the early part of my second year, I, I kind of faced facts that you know, I'm not, doctor is not going to be my title. Um, it's going to be something more in the creative field. So. I can totally relate to that. I wanted to do med school. I, and uh, actually was headed to being a chiropractor, but you know, at age 19, uh, drinking beer, playing football and chasing <laughs> girls was a lot more interesting than yes. orga organic chemistry. And I compared my backpack with everybody else that I went to school with. I'm like, this is ridiculous. So life choices, um, maybe looking back to be different, but I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I had different priorities at that time, but you know, stupid choices at 19. So, well, and you don't let it, you wouldn't, you look back today and you're like, would I ever let an 18 or 19 year old pick my career path or my life path? <laughs> no, it, it's, it's crazy that, that we're even expected to do that at 18 anyway. Yeah. It's rough. Uh, it's rough. I've had kids that have jumped around in majors and then I've had kids that locked on and, and yep. finished. So it's all individual. So did you finish up in, in creative writing? What did you end up studying? I ended up majoring in uh, communications and Spanish. Okay. Um, and I decided I, I actually graduated a little bit early and I decided I would go ahead and get my master's. Okay. So that was kind of, I would say my next leap. Um, I became the youngest person to get into the master's program at University of South Carolina. Oh, wow. So um, when... I had to not, not fight my way in, but at first I was um, declined because of my, I was only 21. Okay. Um, just turned 21. And um, I got the opportunity to uh, appeal 
And I went in front of the board and I had an hour to talk um, and, and tell them why I would be a good fit and that they wouldn't regret it. And I think it's probably the, the most nervous I had ever been in my life um, going to do that. It was pouring down rain that day and I was trying to look professional and I was still 21. And, um, but it, it, it worked out well. I ended up, um, I not only got in, I excelled and I, those people, there were several on that board that became lifelong mentors. Um, it was wonderful. So what did you get your master's in? Mass communication. Mass communication. All right. Fantastic. Well, uh, I, I can tell that you're not a go-getter. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> get her master's at age 22, 23. So what was next? What did you go do? Are you looking for the corporate type job? Did you want to be an entrepreneur? What was next? Well, I, I thought I wanted to have the corner office, with the windows and work in an agency setting and wear a suit every day. I thought that's what I wanted. And I started applying to the big cities to do that. Uh, got some good interviews somewhere along the way, met who is now my husband. So I ended up um, still wanting the same goal, but I was going to stay in Charleston because he had a good job in Charleston. Okay. Got the good job, kept it for maybe a year, realized not for me, quit on a whim on my lunch break. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay, so I understand where the leaper might come in. Um, yeah, so, and I was, and I, and this is my normal vernacular to say, "What's your next hop?" So uh, I guess it's pretty appropriate for you. So I can, I can be your, <laughs> yeah, the visual to go with that. So, yeah. so you just. I, quit. I remember, I remember that day sitting on there was a a giant. There's a giant bridge in Charleston that bridges the downtown area to another area called Mount Pleasant, and. Mm -hmm. They were in the process of rebuilding the bridge. So I was sitting on the old one in traffic, more rush hour traffic. And I was watching the people build this bridge. They were dangling off the side as they spackled the, the concrete or, or whatever. And there was probably six of them and they were just hanging there perilously over the river, but they were laughing and they were happy and they were not a care in the world doing their job. And I was jealous. I was jealous that I was sitting in traffic for the umpteenth time that I was going to sit inside all day long in front of a computer on this beautiful spring day. Yep. And I, 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 I thought about it all morning long as I sat there and I went to lunch. And when I came back, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not kidding. When I say I got in the dumpster in my heels to get a box to take my stuff home from my office and I quit. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that, that was the next leap. And I picked up a business license on the way home. Fantastic. So you, it sounds like you started your first um, business. What'd you do? My first business, I opened the first pet sitting in home pet sitting business um, that, that I know of in, in that area. Um, okay. and I scaled it quickly to a large, we had thousands of clients in the Charleston area. Wow. Now in home, does that mean you'd go in and check on the, the, the pad or yeah. how, how so did we, that work? We, um, I had, this is a problem that we had run into with our own pets. When we would travel, we didn't want to take our dogs to kennels. Yeah. So it's, I it's wanted such someone, a, it's a yeah, horribly I wanted someone traumatic to experience. Yeah. In the house. Yeah. And, um, so that's what I, I did. I created where we would go up to four times a day for 30 minute visits mm -hmm. and we would leash walk, play in the yard, feed water. We did house plants. We kept the chlorine in the pool. We did, we got the mail, everything. So all you had to do was take your suitcases and get in the car. And we were there for the nice. pet in the house. That's great. That's great. It was fun. So and I was outside and outside, doing the, the fun stuff. Done. And hanging out with dogs and cats. Um, how long did you do this? Because I know you're the professional leaper. So I did it for almost 10 years. 10 years. Fantastic. I did. Um, I, I freelanced on the side. That's kind of how I kept my, uh, I 
word of mouth kind of got around. I kept a handful of clients that I just, I wrote for, I did their website stuff. I did their press releases, that sort of thing while mm -hmm. I ran this ran other business. business. Um, well, fantastic. It, I'm sorry. I said, fantastic. Yeah, it, it was, it was a good mix of both for me. I got my creative outlet. Um, I kept writing and I got to have variety every day, new pets, new houses, new everything every day. Okay. So we have to ask the next question. What was next? What was the next top? Because you did that for 10 years and I know you're not 11. So, um, well, I, uh, the first inkling we got that the, uh, an opportunity was going to come for us to move overseas. Okay. I put out some feelers and I sold the pet sitting business. Um, a couple moved from Oklahoma to buy the business and, Lovely, lovely people that, that I think were a good fit to continue what I had started. And they, they really took it to the next level, which was great because I had kind of reached a point where I was kind of ready to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I was able to seize the opportunity to come overseas being free and clear of my business. Um, and our, our first trip to Germany happened, not our first trip, our first move first move okay now you were talking to me off air that your husband uh was part of that because your government you know government contracting yeah my husband's a dod engineer so civilian okay. but with the military with the military fantastic so how long did you stay in germany the first time the first time we did a, a little sh well I, I i'll digress we did a almost one year stint a while back, but the first time we moved, moved, it was for three years. For three years. Fantastic. Yeah. So um, what was the biggest change in the German culture compared to Charleston? Where to begin? Yes. Um, so many things, so many things different. Um, trying to think back of when we first started coming this way and it was, probably the demeanor of people. And, and, you know, and I'm, I'm from the South and I, you know, we're raised to be, you know, nice, sweet, pleasant, you know, you talk with people in line, you hold yes. the doors, you wave all these things. Um, it's not like that here. Um, the Germans, and it, it's taken years of, of, I have several really good German friends now, but Germans don't believe in the, the small talk with people that they don't know. Yes. And it took me some time. At first, you, you feel very, they don't like me or they're judging me or I've done something wrong or, or something. It took me years, but I absolutely love that piece of the German culture now. I find it very refreshing. I find it almost like a one less responsibility. Like you can just stand in line quietly and wait your turn and you don't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a good, um, I don't know. I've really enjoyed that. I, I, another big thing that, that stuck out for me was the amount of rest that this culture has built in, you know, Sundays are closed. Yes. You know, you, you're not buying your groceries. You're not going shopping. Like you're meant to be with your family or resting or, or something at home. And the way they build in vacation to their employees, you know, you have, I think it's a minimum of 12 weeks. Yes. And you, there's a, even a, a thing that you have to take multiple weeks together so that yes. you can do an extended trip. I think it's lovely. Mothers yes. get, you know, time off when they have their, their babies. Um, I don't know that that was a, a, a very big, and it's not that at the beginning, it was very challenging because yes. I need to buy groceries on Sundays. Yeah. But no, you don't. Nope. And it's a mindset shift that once you embrace it, it is such a gift. Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I have had the opportunity to do business around the world. And uh, the it's interesting and great the way the Europeans are, you know, when they go on holiday. Because when you go on holiday, they're off. They're not, they don't have their computers with them. They don't have their cell phones. They're not connected to their email. Uh, the only culture that I saw that was even bigger on that than um, the Europeans is you have the Israelis 
from the Jewish people who are really hardcore, you know, practicing, you know, their faith, not only do they have holiday, they have about 800 um, Jewish holidays. And yeah, so, yeah. and then of course their Sabbath is Saturday. And so if you're going to do work with our friends that are in uh, Israel and they're, you know, hardcore Jewish, but, you know, I, I asked them, when do you guys work? Because you're always, you know, they're not like Americans, you know, time off. What do you, well, that's stealing from the company. So yes, it is wonderful. And I have learned to take the Sundays off the Sabbath and I try my best to make it so other people don't have to work that day. And so yeah. I stay out of the stores. My only really bad habit that I do on Sundays is usually watching football. So um, other than that, I, I work pretty hard to keep Sundays down, but Who's, who's your team? Are you a Broncos? Yeah, I'm a Broncos guy just because I grew up here, but I'm big in college football. And so my dad went to the University of Nebraska. So we're big Husker fans. And then we had some kids over at BYU. So BYU fans. And so Saturday and Sunday, I watch a lot of football. So that tends to be the case. So anyhow. All right. So getting used to the German culture, you were there three years. Uh, where'd you go from there? Did you hop back to the States or, or what was your next move? Well, we did. We, we made full, full use of our time here. We traveled extensively. And when we first moved, our daughter had just turned three. So she got into the German kindergarten thing for several years, became fluent very quickly, kind of even acted as our translator in some ways. But we, we traveled. We're at 42 countries and counting. Mm -hmm. Um at the end of the three years, we opted to go back. So when you're a civilian, a, a lot of the contracts, you, you have to go back for 24 months before you're eligible to come again. Okay. So we went back at the end of our three years um, with the idea, the inkling that we would probably come again. Um, pretty much solidified that within a few months. We went back to Charleston where we own a house. Um, and we, we loved our time there because my family is there. Nice. So it was really great being back supported again and having some familiar. Um, there's something to be said for having support and love built in around you. Yeah, absolutely. When you're living abroad or traveling abroad and you don't have your family around you, you, you it, it helps you to be independent and grow. But it's not, it, there's nothing like having your family around. There's not. Yeah, there's, there's not. And me being an only child, that, it, that was the single biggest hurdle for me um, leading up to that first move. I, I mean, there were moments that I knew for certain I wasn't going, that I couldn't go, that yep. it was just, you know, I'm an only, my daughter is the only grandchild. It was very difficult all around. So returning there and, and having those two years in between was just incredible. Um, yeah. yeah, it was great. And then COVID happened. Yep. And uh, that was, let's see, it started in March, I guess. Um, and then we moved back last September. Okay. So we had a portion of the pandemic with my family, which was, which was wonderful because we were in kind of a bubble together. Nice. And then we moved back here during, during the pandemic. So uh, are they still relatively locked down there? What's it, what's it look like in German? Um, Germany, Germany is fairly locked down and has been pretty much since we got here. Mm -hmm. um, they, they keep things closed. We've had a couple times where they'll loosen the reins a little bit, but then at the first sign of a, of a wave, they it's locked down again. So mm -hmm. um, our numbers are coming down again off the third wave. So there is rumor that some stores will start reopening maybe, but we haven't, I haven't been to a restaurant since October. Wow. I haven't been in a store other than a grocery store since October. <laughs> wow. It, it's different. Borders, <clears throat> borders are closed. You know, my, my family hasn't been able to come obviously. So it's, we're kind of sitting tight in Germany. Wow. That's, you know, uh, Colorado, it's, it's kind of a, a contradiction. You know, people here are really uh, independent and, and focused on being outside and that kind of stuff. But yeah, we have a very liberal uh, governor because of the concentration of voters in the primary city, Denver. And so we've had this interesting sort of battle going on, but we were ma mandate. They just lifted the mandates. There's, we don't have, everything's open and there's no restrictions and those types of things. But a large percent of people in Colorado were only really wearing their masks 
in the couple stores that required them. So it was, it's been kind of an interesting, it's been an interesting human, uh, human watching. Uh, yeah, I think I can imagine that's, yeah. and it sounds to me like Charleston, when I talk to friends and family in Charleston, it seems very similar. Yeah. Um, the mask mandate is gone yeah. and but but most people say that pretty much since the new year, it has kind of felt like pandemic. What pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. In fact, there are a lot of people walking around here saying it's over. Uh, and even though they've only vaccinated about 40 percent of the people. So interesting. So you're a uh, Airbnb super host. Tell me about uh, getting involved in the short term rental business. <sighs> So I have kind of an interesting story with that. So I, 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 I joke around that um, I didn't choose the Airbnb life. It chose me. Okay. So my grandmother passed away a few years ago and we didn't know what to do with her home. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of selling it, parting with it just wasn't an option at that time. And we couldn't move into it. Um, so we thought, I mean, but it's not a big city. It's not, it's a, it's a small house. It doesn't have any, surely we can't do an Airbnb, but what else are we going to do? So we're going to give it a whirl. And it took a lot of trial and error and a lot of figuring it out. And it, it, after several months, it became a, a successful Airbnb. Fantastic. Um, so when was this, was this, was this pre- a pandemic or what? Yes, this was several years ago. This was 2017. Okay. 17, 18, somewhere in there. Okay. Um, um, so it's how about the, I'm assuming the pandemic probably caused you some stress then? It, it caused some stress, but you know, uh, what, what has happened other than the, the few months during the complete lockdown, what happened sense is that people are looking for alternatives to traditional hotels, traditional sure. vacations. Mm -hmm. And so it has really created quite the boom. Well, that's great. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So I kind of got to, to cut my teeth on, on that house by chance. It was, you know, a bittersweet way of continuing my grandmother's story. But we have since, con you know, we own multiple now. We, we converted our home into an Airbnb and have it, it, we're experiencing it kind of on both sides of the fence as a business person myself, as well as a super host, that it, the boom is happening as people look for alternatives. Yeah, you know, especially here in the United States, you know, travel by car is not restricted anywhere. Right. And, and so we saw like the big RVs. Oh, my goodness. They were on fire because nobody, you know, didn't want to fly. They didn't want to stay in a hotel. So if people did that and car travel is, you know, nobody's stopping you at the border anywhere, you know, right. you know, people can go any just about anywhere and there's nobody checking IDs or, you know, roads closed or any of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I can see how you would have a boom in that environment because yeah, there's no restrictions and you're not staying with a whole bunch of other people in your Airbnb rental. Exactly. And you can, t you know, as, as host, you can take steps, you know, keyless entry. Um, sure where you don't have to meet your guests anymore, you know, that you just give them code and you communicate well without, so you don't have all of those contact points, which was essential because we fortunately stayed pretty booked. Um, yeah. I mean, it wasn't a normal time, but we, it, people traveling for business because business continued and being able to implement those steps and those extra precautions allowed people who weren't comfortable staying, you know, having to check in at a desk and right. pass people in elevators. It was great. Fantastic. So uh, I know you morphed that into a bit business beyond just owning them. So will you give out your website for us real quick? Sure. It's just Aaron Thomas communications.com. Okay. Fantastic. So that was Aaron Thomas communications.com, right? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. So knowing that you're just a slacker and you just don't do anything interesting. Um, it looks like when I've been to your website, pre-show uh, doing all that kind of fun stuff that you've turned this into kind of an advisor mentor type of business, right? Uh, yeah, I, I did. So I, I have spent the last 16 years as a writer and helping you know, entrepreneurs and brands. But this division, um, I decided uh, sometime along these, the last year or so that I was getting a lot of inquiries about how to do this, 
how to, you know, right. people either thinking of getting into the, to the rental market or people who already had them who happened to stay with us, who liked our messaging Sure. and people asking how to do that. And so I kind of ran with it and it has just, it's been a wonderful thing, helping people eliminate that trial and error and the, the leaving money on the table that I went through getting my, my first one started. Okay. So without giving away all your consulting, what's one of the biggest mistakes that a Airbnb owner um, does? I would say that I'll tell you. So there's no excuse for ever having a guest that is disappointed. Yes. And I'll say the, the reason that is, if you are clear and concise and honest in your messaging, in your listing, in the pictures you provide, in the description of the area, then people, by the time they get to your house, they know exactly what they're expecting. Yes. When I, when I've had people say, well, my guests showed up and they were disappointed with X, Y, Z. That's a red flag that somewhere along the way, either you painted the wrong picture or you omitted something. Like I tell owners, don't, don't try to hide that you have, you know, shag carpet in a bedroom or something. You want to celebrate that. Right. Exactly. You know, put that, celebrate the quirks of each property, because I guarantee you what attracted you to your property is going to attract plenty of people. So if you're clear and concise in your messaging, you will not have disappointed guests. Well, I wish you had been coaching an Airbnb that uh, my family rented about uh, four years ago. Uh, (laughs) We were heading out to go to a cruise, but had a, a day or two ahead of time for, you know, they wanted to hit Disneyland. Uh, which I don't understand anymore, but they wanted to go to Disneyland and we stayed in a place and the expectations could not have been, it was a huge gap. And we left horrified because the person just literally oversold and we would have been fine because you know I'm not, I'm not a high end person. I don't really care about a lot of things, but oh my goodness, there were, there were so many gaps in the, in the communications as far as the property things that weren't working, things that were not how they were told. And it would have been fine. It would have been fine if they would have just told us. Now, we left going to never again. And we gave them, the, gave them a horrible rating because while the location was decent to get to Disneyland, it was a horrible property. And oh, it, I'm sorry. That, yeah. it, doesn't it just spoil oh, the, yeah. the rest of your time? I mean, it just puts that, that damper on the memories from the rest of the trip that were awesome. Yeah, it's a fun. I, we look back and it's the funny part. It's like, remember that dump we stayed in kind of thing? But, you know, there was, it was crazy. They, you know, every room was themed, you know, to Disney. So that was kind of cool and stuff. But there, I, I don't want to get into the full list of things. But it was just, and again, it was the, the expectations, you know, yeah. if they would have said, hey, this, the reason why it's priced this way is because we're still working on it and there are some warts and moles, but, you know, we'll, we'll take care of you. We would have been fine. But it was billed as this, you know, palace, and it was the, about the farthest thing from it. Well, and, and I think a lot of people, I, I have been in that same situation. We have found ourselves, I mean, we, we love the Airbnb premise and have been staying in them for years right? and have, have found the hard way, that, that same sort of thing. We've had some that we can't even stay in, like some we would get there and it was so filthy and alive with, <laughs> yeah, that, you know, and things like that. And so I, I completely commiserate. So I think I had that in mind when I started my own, like thinking of things like when, as I, when I'm a traveler, yeah. what do I want to see and know about these properties? Right. And if, if people from the start will, will paint the right picture, you, you trust that you're going to attract the right guests. Right. Now, now being a communications person and, you know, trained to the hilt on that, you know, with your master's and, and college degree and stuff, do you work, do you help them in their presentation? I mean, specifically, what, what services do you provide an Airbnb owner? Well, the, my main focus is, is in the messaging. So okay. a lot of times, and I'm in the process of actually creating a, a stepping stone for what I do in, in, the form of an online course, because I would like for people to be able to, some people want to 
know how to do it, but they want to do it on their own. Sure. So that is coming and I'm working on that now. But, but the main thing I focus on with clients is from a coaching perspective, getting them clear on what their property is, the story behind it, because stories are what connect us to our audience, whether it's the owner's story, the property story, showcasing the things, getting them clear on the fun parts of their property. Okay. And then we start crafting the messaging to get it in front of the right people. So we look at the headline because you have 2.7 seconds to yep. attract someone to click. Yep. So the headline matters. If you're just saying three bedroom, two bath in a neighborhood off the interstate, that people are going to scroll right past you. But if you're saying, Hey, we've got a kitschy cottage in, you know, walking distance to X, Y, Z. Okay. That might fit the bill. Then we move into their listing and, and again, highlighting the unique features, talking about the area because the area matters. Yep. And then we, we work on photography. Um, I, I like to guide them through what to look for, what to focus on. Um, and then a, a huge piece of the component at the, you know, kind of at the tail end is the messaging templates. So having things in place for when you get an inquiry, this is what you send. When you get a booking, this is the welcome message. Right. When someone's getting ready to check in, here's the details that you send. So you don't have to keep rewriting those every time. Right. You know, we, we do the work one time and you have templates that you can then tweak accordingly. Yep. And you experience it with me in booking. I have one outbound communication that I rarely even have to do anything else with. I mean, it's copy, paste, send it off. People book. I mean, that's just automation the way to do it. Is, yeah. the, is the key to the game, you know? Yeah. No need to reinvent the wheel every time. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, that's an endless opportunity because, you know, the, the short term rental business is global. There's a lot yeah. of people uh, doing that. So, what else are you doing with Aaron, Communica- Aaron Thomas Communications? <clears throat> I do a lot of working for. Um, entrepreneurs, um, a lot of women, I work, I work some with men, but in terms of the entrepreneurs, a lot of women kind of leveling up their messaging, whether it's their LinkedIn bios, the bios on their website, their website, copy, um, blogs, newsletters, that sort of thing, just helping people, um, kind of level up through clear and concise, creative messaging. Sure. Sure. So you mentioned that you got the you have these courses coming. Do you have an idea when you're going to release those? Um, I'm hopeful in the in the coming months. I would like to say wow. by mid summer. Okay. Mid mid to late summer, maybe. Fantastic, fantastic. So I know that's on the horizon. Okay. The next big question is what's next after that? You're a professional uh, leaper. What's next? Let's see. Well, we have a trip uh, to go home. Uh, coming up next month. It will be the first time we have seen family since September. Okay. So we are going there. And while we're there, we are taking a a little trip down to the Dominican Republic, which is always a favorite. And it is a belated 40th birthday celebration for me. Oh, well, congratulations. It'll be our first trip in forever. And I'm super excited for that. Yeah. Um, And then we're the rumors are that Europe is going to start slowly reopening. So the hope is that the next jump will be diving back into to trip planning, which is one of our favorite things to do and coming up with our list of destinations and hit the ground running maybe by, by the fall. Yeah. Europe is so much fun because the mass transit systems are amazing. It is so affordable to pop between places, you know, really inexpensive flights, trains, even buses to places. And so it just, it just permeates the ability to travel very easily across all of Europe. It's awesome. Well, and the proximity of everything, I think really, and that's one thing about Germany specifically that we love is that it's kind of the center of the wheel and you can, you know, within four or five hours, there's probably, I don't know, eight countries that you can, you can be to. Um, I think people, especially those who haven't had the chance to visit Europe yet, it, I think living in the U S you, you think, golly, to go to California from the East coast, you have to commit and it's expensive and it's a five hour flight here. 
I mean, you can, we can drive to Amsterdam from right here in less than six hours. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny here in Colorado, people don't realize how big of a state it is compared to like on the East Coast. I used to live out East. You know, if I go to one end from, let's say, Sterling out towards Nebraska, down to Montrose, which is down by the Southwest corner, it's 10 hours of travel. And we have oh, I had no state. idea. I didn't know that either. Yeah, 10 hours of travel. And that is with clear, dry, open roads. And you get into some of the mountain roads and you get into any issues where there's been an accident or snow and those types of things. Um, yeah, I've driven one way seven hours from Denver down to Montrose and, and or if you go down to Telluride or those places, it's seven, eight hours with the driving and you haven't left the state. And if I did that- I didn't, I didn't realize that either. I've been to Colorado a couple of times, Denver, Golden, um, Colorado Springs, but I, I did not, I don't think of it being vast like that. It is. It's incredible. And you mentioned my hometown. I'm from Golden. So, um, Oh, beautiful town. I love it. And it's bigger. I'm sure it's bigger now than it once was, but what a lovely place. Well, it's hard to expand Golden because it's kind of locked between the Table Mountains and the Front Range Mountains. And so you can't add a whole lot of people there unless you stop building, start building on top of those Table Mountains, which they're all open space. So it's a little contained valley, little city. It's a good place. It's, I love the, the feel of it. And it's such a nice um, change of pace when you've been in yeah. Denver or Colorado Springs to be, yeah. get to go out there. We had some friends living there um, a few years ago and it's it, just a lovely place. Yeah. It, and it's nice. It's 20 minutes from downtown Denver. So you can, you can hop to anything, but you're still in this little bowl there. So yeah, anyway, well, it's great. I, um, I'm excited for your online courses. That sounds exciting. Um, And I'm glad that you were able to come with us this morning on our journey to learn about what you're doing. Uh, I'm going to push your, your, this podcast to a lot of friends that have uh, some Airbnbs and short-term properties. Oh, thank you. uh, Thanks. You know, everybody can sharpen the saw no matter how successful we are. So the last question I have for you this morning on our journey is um, one that I ask everybody at the end of the shows or the episodes is, uh, you know, in the Western uh, world, we have this thing called a bucket list, okay? And it's the things we want to accomplish. And I can imagine you have a long list because you're quite the wander, uh, wanderlust type person. And just because you wander doesn't mean you're lost. Um, But anyway, there's always an opposite list to everything, okay? Now that opposite list is things we don't want to do or have no interest in doing, okay? Now that list rhymes with bucket and starts with an F, but this is a family show, so I'm not going to say it. So this is the effort list, okay? So while you're thinking there, wheels are turning because it doesn't sound like you've probably been asked this question before. Uh, what might be on your effort list? I'll share a couple with you, okay? Uh, I'm never going to have pet snakes. I'm not going to, I don't, no, I'm not going to have pet snakes, okay? That's, that's something on the list. I'm not going to eat sardines, okay? And then the big one is I will never, ever again do a Lakota Sioux sweat lodge, Okay. The concept of excessive heat, excessive humidity, excessive drumming, and excessive chanting all at the same time? No, I'm not going to do it, okay? So what might be an item or two that would be on Aaron's effort list? Ooh, let's see. I will never jump out of a plane or bungee jump. Those are, that's a very common one. I'm not, no. Zero interest in ever doing something like that. Um, Something I will never do again is one of those giant coach buses that do tours where you're packed in and never again. I've done two in my life. One was in um, Rome and the other one was into Venice and they were hot and sweaty and loud. And we were like halfway down the thing, never again. But <laughs> I would rather skip a destination if the only way I can see it is on one of those coach buses, unless I own the bus and I can pick like the five people on the bus with me. <laughs> well, then we'll probably have to talk about my recommendations about Lakota Sioux uh, sweat lodges, because if you don't like the hot and, and humid and sweaty and all, no. So anyway, well, it's been great to have you on today. And folks, I would please ask you to stop by AaronThomasCommunications.com. 
And uh, thank you for coming on this day, Aaron. Thank you so much for having me. This was lovely. I, I so enjoyed our chat. Yeah, it's been fun. So folks, we'll call this an episode for today. Uh, please do stop by the show website, uh, rexandrewshow.com. Again, please stop by Aaron's site, Aaron, um, th Aaron Thomas communications.com. So until next time, I just have the three things I say every time, be safe, but be bold and make it a great day.